my ladies, gentles, in you come, and those who are neither, all or some, come hither all such tales to hear of misrule, magic, flight, and fear, of things that unleash pandemonium, and heroes to defend us from them, and for those who thusly need inform me, in the show notes you'll find content warnings. So cautioned, audience, come with me to the Pantaloon Society. Episode 1, Dr. McClown London, the sprawling metropolis, the old smoke. Not always the capital of the English, of course. Prior to the Norman Conquest under Alfred of Wessex, Winchester held that particular honour. But it is to London we go now, to a leafy street arrayed with the city's usual jumble of architectural styles. Warm yellow sandstone, the bright white Portland lime so beloved of Sir Christopher Wren, and the pale tan, many-windowed institutional brickwork of the cardiology ward of the children's hospital. Let us swoop in like a tiny bird through the open window of the fourth floor where we find ourselves in a playroom. A very clean, institutional playroom. A room that perhaps was once a ward or a theatre, and could be very easily converted back into one or the other, if the brightly coloured sofas and the tables with crayons neatly tidied away and the jolly stickers of various woodland animals were to be removed. Here we find a group of children gathered in the playroom. Some are in their pyjamas, some not. Some are with their parents, and there are some whose parents have taken the opportunity to get a coffee and some food. Some are very sick, pale and dark-eyed, with cannulas in situ held to their arms by white surgical tape, their smiles and their laughter weak like the twittering of starlings. Some are well, or seem so, and their laughter is strong and bright. Oh dear me, what a palaver. Oh, my balls have gone everywhere. However shall I find them all now? At the front of this room, a jaunty figure holds court, clad in multicoloured patchwork with a red nose upon their face. This is Chen, our hero. They are a short person, perhaps five foot four, or 163 centimetres, or if she were a horse and thus measured at the withers, around 14 hands. A reasonably sized pony. Chen is not a pony, though. Chen is a clown. As well as short, she is plump, gently curved in a way that might put one in mind of a friendly gnome or some other benevolent creature that might be found in a forest dancing in a fairy ring by a lost traveller. If asked to give their age, an observer would say young, but might have difficulty saying whether they were in their teens or their twenties. Where has the last one gone? At the time we observed them, they were wearing a well-worn pair of bright red oversized trousers and a baggy shirt made of many patches in purple, yellow and white, hand-stitched together. Her face is painted in white grease paint with purple and yellow hearts scattered across the cheeks and a big red smile across the mouth. A sparkly wig in the same colours as the shirt completes the outfit. Atop this ensemble is a white lab coat into the pockets of which have been placed and then occasionally produced and juggled. A child's plastic stethoscope, a series of handkerchiefs all tied together at the corners, several balls, a pack of cards, a hand puppet frog named Harry, also wearing a lab coat, and an apple. Only one item of clothing she wears is entirely sensible, her shoes. They are, in accordance with hospital policy, not enormous in red, but black, sensible, without a heel in excess of one inch, and have a good grip on the sole. Well, look at this. Oliver, why are you hiding my juggling ball behind your ear? Jen has just finished a delightful display of sleight of hand, producing and juggling the scarves, the balls and the apple, whilst chatting in a friendly way with the children. Now, having previously misdirected the audience while they pulled him out of their pocket and popped him on their hand, they address the assembled children as Harry the Frog. Come, come, that's enough silliness for now. You're quite right, Dr Harry. Now it's time for learning. Some of the children sigh. The fun could only last for so long. Learning how to make puppets. Gather round. The children are much happier about the prospect of learning to make puppets. 
Jen opens her case, which she has placed on the low table surrounded by child-sized plastic chairs. It is an old-fashioned battered brown leather suitcase of the sort often seen in period dramas when the doctor arrives to attend to some ailing heroine. They had found it in a charity shop. The words Dr. McClown are painted on it in spidery white writing. Inside there is a selection of puppets, both hand and string operated, and a pile of craft supplies and ping pong balls. Jen cheerfully empties the craft supplies and balls all over the table. Felt and fabric slides around, pens roll everywhere, ping pong balls bounce off the table and skitter to various places around the room, pursued by laughing children, and to the disapproval of at least one mother. Jen tells the children that ping pong balls often try to escape so they may return to their native land of ping, where all creatures are entirely spherical and any that can't be found will probably have gone home. Eventually, every child has a ping pong ball and is happily drawing some sort of face on it, some quite horrific, or cutting out finger-sized felt clothes to glue onto it. Several different puppets appear from the case and attempt to have conversations with the gradually forming ping pong ball people, often commenting on how lovely their faces, or indeed lack of faces, are. Harry the Frog is lent to a small red-headed child who reaches for him and hugs his little wooden head very hard while squeaking, Frog! Frog! Partway through the play session, a woman appears to watch the proceedings. It is to be assumed she is a medical professional of some kind, as she has a hospital pass, and the stethoscope around her neck is absolutely not made of red and green plastic. She is not particularly tall, but she is taller than Jen, and she is quite thin. It is the thinness of age, the thinness of a dignified heron observing a pond in case some doomed frock should show its face and be rapidly speared. She is dressed very sensibly indeed, in a black skirt and green blouse with the sleeves rolled up to facilitate the careful washing of hands. She leans against the doorframe just inside the playroom, watching curiously. Alas, all good things must end, particularly when dinner time approaches and small people's stomachs begin to grumble. When the time comes, the children are collected by parents who have returned from getting their coffee or their sandwich or some other brief respite from worry and childcare. Jen remains behind to clean up the detritus of the puppet making, retrieve errant felt tip pens and pack them all away in their case. As she gathers up a handful of felt, she looks up and realises one of the children has not gone yet. Hello, is your mum not back yet? Or your dad? The child, who is in Spider-Man pyjamas, does not answer this question, instead holding up a puppet and announcing, I've got a puppet too. The child's parent will probably return for him. Yes, probably him, soon. He is one of the children who is visibly not well. Jen can see a pallor under his dark complexion, and his tightly curled hair is thin in places. So you have been a fine fellow, yes too. The puppet was indeed a fine fellow. He was large. Large enough that the boy's arms were beginning to droop holding him up. And, Jen suspected, quite old. His paint was worn and chipped in places, showing aged wood underneath, and his clothes, a stripy green shirt and red trousers, were faded. His eyes were painted with a blank expression, and he stared vacantly past Jen's shoulder. He had once been a string marionette, they thought, because they could see the holes for their attachment points in his feet, and round fingerless hands. Once upon a time he must have danced but now he was this little boy's doll. Jen's fingers itched to make him dance. She held them behind her back and leaned down, not very far, because, as has been explained before, she was quite short. Can I take you back to your mummy and daddy? They must be missing you. Can't work. Gonna be back later. And Charlie, I'm in here a lot. I have a VSD. I don't know what that is. A hole in my heart. Oh dear. Can they not just pop a little cock in it? This question appeared to bewilder Charlie entirely, and he held the puppet close to his chest and regarded her curiously. Dunno. Well, if you're going to stay, you'll have to help me tidy up. No thanks. Bye bye, Dr. Clown. With that, Charlie tottered off towards the door, presumably to return to his bed in the ward next door. Jen gave him a little wave. For a second, Jen could have sworn the head of the puppet looking over his shoulder twitched upwards to fix her with a blank gaze that chilled her to her very bones. They blinked and shook their head, dispelling such curious thoughts. A trick of the light, perhaps, or how the puppet was being carried by the boy. They can sort of pop a cork in it. The doctor, who had been stood by the door, had left her position leaning against the wall and come to join Jen. She began to help pick up discarded toys and ping-pong balls, but somewhat stiffly and slowly. There's a device that we can put in, with a catheter, to plug it up. Otherwise it takes open heart surgery. Normally Charlie would have had that by now, but he was doing fine until recently, so his doctors thought the VSD had closed on its own. I know the family. I cared for his uncle years ago when he was in with the same thing. He passed away, sadly. Uh, Veronica Harrington. Jen McIntyre. Oh, Dr. McLeod, if you prefer. Uh, she they pronouns. Uh, do you not need to be back in the wards? <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm retired. I'm on the bank staff now. I take the old shift to help out, and I'm done for the day. I haven't seen you here before. First time here. I moved down from Glasgow a month ago. Well, welcome to London. 
Thanks. It is good clown etiquette to remove one's makeup as soon as possible after performing, to reduce the likelihood of anything happening whilst wearing it that might bring shame upon the clown. In the hospital toilets, Jen was carefully adhering to this rule. A small pile of grease paint-coated makeup wipes were building up beside the sink. She had already removed her purple and yellow wig, revealing like a sort of trick, or Russian nesting doll, yet more purple hair underneath. This purple hair was their own, however, and it was wavy and shaved into an undercut, except for the top, which was longer and swept to one side to fall just below the ear. It was also damp and slick from being under the wig for several hours. The skin revealed as the makeup wipes were drawn across it was coppery, and the roots at the base of the purple waves were very dark brown. Once the last of the red and white and the small hearts were gone, they fluffed up their hair and packed the wig and wig cap carefully away in bags. Opening their suitcase, they paused. There was something missing. Lab coat, stethoscope, craft supplies, apple, puppets. Ah, uh, no frog. She had never got him back from the red-headed child, who was still hugging him happily the last time she had looked across the table. Well, he would survive until she could reclaim him tomorrow. He was made of robust enough wood to weather the attentions of a small child. They knew because they had carved him themselves, carefully whittled the finger-operated jaw and cut the jolly smile into his foggy face. They packed away the rest of the tools of their trade and headed out to the hospital to go home. Up in the paediatric cardiology ward, the red-headed child was indeed hugging Harry the Frog. The children, full of hospital dinner and worn out by an afternoon's excitement, were beginning to get ready for bed. Many had their parents with them, reading them stories or ensuring they all had blankets, teddy bears or other items necessary for sleeping. As time went on, all the children went to bed, and the nurses switched out the lights. Charlie's father sat on the chair beside his bed, napping, with a fantasy novel with a dragon on the cover, lying discarded on his lap. Charlie himself was curled up with the puppet beneath the blanket next to him. In the darkness of the ward, the puppet's head twitched and began to lift up. Stiffly, the jaw opened, and the puppet shuffled towards the boy and fastened it onto his wrist, so gently as not to wake him. Charlie moved, fretting in his sleep. His father half woke up and reached over to stroke his head, soothing him. The puppet quickly returned to stillness. Right in early on the morning of the next day, Jen pottered into the ward, waved cheerily to the clerk at the desk and opened the door to the playroom. A terrible sight greeted them. There had been a murder. Upon the table lay a gruesome scene. Splinters were strewn about, torn cloth lay on the floor, and in the centre of it all the head of Harry the Frog, his jaw torn out of the housing, and the rest of his head cleaved neatly in two. Jen's hand flew to her mouth in horror, and she ran to the table to inspect the damage. Picking up the pieces, they could see that one side of his head was splintered entirely as if he had been smashed into a hard surface. Someone had hit him so hard against something that it was split along the line of the open mouth. The cloth of his body had been ripped away and lay on the floor. Jen sadly picked it up and wrapped it around Harry's poor cleaved head, concealing his painted face in case one of the children should see. They brought the sad corpse of the puppet to the ward clerk at the desk, and mutely showed it to him. Oh my goodness, what happened to your little frog? Jen simply shrugged, their clowns smiling congruously at odds with the sadness in their eyes. Nobody in the ward knew who could have committed the dreadful frog murder. The ward sister was horrified. The red-headed girl, whose name it transpired was Elsie, had woken up to find Harry no longer on the bedside table and immediately started crying. Whatever had happened to him had happened during the night, it appeared. Elsie was not a suspect. There was no way such a small girl could have had the strength to do that sort of damage, even if she'd wanted to, which seemed highly unlikely. Where still, there was another unhappy child. Charlie's puppet was also missing during the night. It was the talk of the ward. Clearly someone who did not like puppets had been sneaking around at night with nefarious purpose. The sad pieces of Harry the Frog were carefully tidied away into Jen's suitcase, and with a heavy heart, and glad of the big smile painted on their face, they launched into today's play session. Today, the more active children had been encouraged to put on plays with their toys for the more unwell ones. The audience gamely clapped as army dolls rode on the back of plush dogs, and teddies wrapped in felt cloaks took bows for them. Charlie did not attend. When Jen asked one of the parents where he was, she said she thought he'd gone to surgery today, but she wasn't sure. He might equally have gone home. Once again, the children filed out, and Jen was left to tidy up and reorganise the room. As they replaced chairs and sofas to their correct positions, they fretted that their lack of enthusiasm had been noticed. Out of the corner of their eye, they spotted an errant ping-pong ball from yesterday, half concealed under a stack of chairs. They knelt on the floor and peered underneath to fish it out. 
At floor level, they were suddenly met with a blank stare. Charlie's puppet was under there as well, eerily peering out at them. Oh, it's only you. You give me a fright. They reached underneath to pull the puppet out and held him up. There was a slight resistance, as if the puppet was stuck on something, but they managed to get him out with a little force. Charlie's been missing you, my fine lad. She sat him down on the table. He stared at her still, blankly, making her feel inexplicably uneasy. She patted him on the head. I'll go and find the nurse, so at least somebody gets that little man back today. It was dinner time, so the ward was busy. A healthcare assistant, Jem, managed to catch confirmed that Charlie had indeed gone to theatre, and therefore could not have his puppet returned to him just yet, and suggested she leave the puppet on his bedside table. This seemed entirely sensible, so Jen returned to the playroom to fetch their puppet. But when they did, the puppet was not there anymore. Jen paused to swallow their heart, which felt like it had made quite a spirited attempt to exit via their throat. There was bound to be some perfectly sensible explanation for this. One of the nurses had come in and seen the puppet and taken him to be returned to his owner, no doubt. Behind them, the door clicked shut. Jen did not turn around. Instead, they walked over to the table. Goodness me, where has that little man gone? I could have sworn I put him down right here. Jen spun around. Charlie's puppet was stood before the closed door. Nothing was keeping it upright. It stood by itself. The blank stare was fixed upon her, and despite the painted face looking precisely as it did before, it exuded malevolence. One painted wooden foot stepped forwards. Did you hurt my hattie, you little monster? And what are you doing to that little laddie? Did you? I? Will you? I? The puppet took another step towards them. Chen glanced across the room. They took a deep breath and reached towards the toy box. They closed their eyes. The toy box began to shake. The top popped open. A teddy bear with glittering glass eyes climbed out. It was followed by several action figures and a doll. The toys ambled casually towards the puppet, who swiveled from side to side in surprise. There's only one toy here. It doesn't belong, and it's ye, laddie. They smiled. The case on the table popped open, and the two halves of Harry the Frog's head rolled out, off the table and along the floor towards the puppet. They stared at him, accusingly. A rocking horse stepped off its wooden rockers and appeared behind him. They kicked him to the floor and stepped on him, holding him down. One of the action figures tied a scarf from Jen's suitcase onto each of his limbs and around his neck. They took hold of one, and the teddy bear another. Then the toys braced and began to pull. The thing in the puppet howled. The toys pulled harder, straining their small bodies. Jen watched. Harry the Frog watched. The howl mounted in intensity. With a nasty, tearing sound, the puppet's left arm came loose, followed by the rest of his limbs, and finally his head, which rolled uselessly away. Jen slumped to the floor, exhausted, as a second later did all the toys. The dismembered head of Harry the Frog rolled back and regarded the ceiling. Mix McIntyre? It was the kindly doctor from before. When had she come in? I can definitely explain. I assure you, there is no need for that. Thank you for dealing with uh, whatever it was. Dr. Harrington offered Jen a hand up, which they gratefully accepted. The pile of toys lay on the floor. Charlie's puppet was still in pieces and still unmoving. Dr. Harrington poked at its head with her sensible shoe. Awful creepy thing. Gave me the willies the moment the boy brought it in. Didn't realise it was possessed, though. (laughs) <laughs> Neither did I. I'm sorry about your frog. Oh, he'll be all right with a bit of wood glue, although he shall ever bear the scars of his brief battle against evil. Mix me again, Tyre. Jen. Jen. I will clear up here. You seem exhausted. And I will dispose of that thing. Carefully. 
It shall be a missing victim of the phantom puppet murderer, I think. Doctor, please, listen to me. I must tell you some things for context, and then I will ask something of you. All right, go on. I am a great believer in the healing power of laughter. Indeed, it is because of my influence at this hospital that there is funding for entertainers like you to come here. I have been a clown here in the past myself. I realise it may not seem like the type, but I assure you I was, and I adored it. Therefore, I sincerely hope that this experience will not prevent you from continuing to work here with these children. Furthermore, I saw what you did here, and I promise you I will not speak a word of it, even if you choose never to return. Your secret is safe with me. Now the request. I would like to talk to you more about this, but I cannot do so here, where we might be interrupted at any time. There is something I would like to show you. Jen nodded, relieved and somewhat intrigued. Good. Gather your things. Take off your makeup. Take a while to compose yourself. Then meet me at Covent Garden Station at seven tonight. The Pantaloon Society is a Cytogram Hair production by Lou Sutcliffe. AM pronouns. Distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 international license. This episode used sounds from freesound.org. For full accreditation, content warnings and transcripts, please see the show notes. To be kept up to date on the show, please do follow on Twitter at Pantaloon Farewell, dear audience, and thank you for listening.